Welcome to another Vault edition of Paul's Security Weekly. This time we go into the Wayback Machine to our interview with none other than Gene Spafford. Lovingly referred to as Spaff, he's a security legend. My co-hosts for this interview were Jack Daniel and Allison Nixon. We covered a wide range of topics, including how the Codebreakers book by David Kahn helped Spaff get his start in security. The link to that book is in the show notes. We also covered the cybersecurity skills gap, cybersecurity legislation, and risk-based decisions and why people choose poorly. Without further ado, here's our interview with Gene Spafford. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Gene Spafford to the show, one of the senior most recognized leaders in the field of computing. He has an ongoing record of accomplishment as senior advisor and consultant on issues of security and intelligence education cybercrime, and computing policy to a number of major companies, law enforcement organizations, academic, and government agencies. With over three decades of experience as a researcher and instructor, Professor Spafford has worked in software engineering, reliable distributed computing, host and network security, digital forensics, computing policy, and computing curriculum designed by Dr. Spafford. He's also a professor with an appointment in computer science at Purdue University, where he's been a member of the faculty since 1987. Welcome, Gene, to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yes. It's, uh, it's nice to have you. Um, I usually start our interviews by asking how you got your start in information security. So I'm very curious to see um, where your start came from. And also, in kind of describing that story, what advice you have for others getting their start in the field? Um, my start actually had a couple different aspects to it. The first part was when I was younger, probably about uh, 12 years old, my uncle, who was an engineer for NASA, gave me a copy of uh, The Code Breakers, uh, Mm. that uh, very classic book on cryptography and the history of secret communications. And I was fascinated by that. Uh, Started reading other material on cryptography and uh, related issues. And this was quite a while back. This was in the uh, 1970s. So I took a few computer classes in my high school. And then when I was an undergraduate, got more involved in computing, got a job at the computing center, uh, and got involved there in helping them establish some of the security on the systems. But I wasn't really viewing it as a career choice. My Graduate work was involved in reliable computing, building network systems that could survive failure and still provide processing. And uh, as an aside on that, some people find it amusing. Back in the mid-80s, we built a distributed computing system that had uh, seamless storage and processing. You could put your work out anywhere on the network, and it would use whatever resources were available find your files wherever they were and would run them. And the name of the system was Clouds. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, a few years back. That's about uh, 27, 28 years ago. <laughs> and then um, uh, after I finished in the reliability area, I did a little work in software engineering because at the time, work in security wasn't considered much for academic pursuit unless uh, you focused on cryptography Mm. or formal methods of of software. So I I continued it as a bit of a hobby. And then when some of the the issues in malicious software like computer viruses uh, and then the Internet Worm program came along, uh, I discovered suddenly that people were interested in the things I'd been doing. Mm. And so I switched my academic focus away from the reliability aspects, and more into the security. And the two very much relate. Very much, yes. Uh, One is when things go wrong, and they may do that on their own, and the other is when things go wrong because people cause them to go wrong. Right, right. 
So what advice do you have for people who are getting their start in information security today? Well, it's a very big area. There are multiple career paths in there. And um, part of it has to do with individual aptitude and longer-term desire. Uh, I think there's a very distinct difference between those people who have the skills to secure a current set of systems and those who actually have a deeper, broader background in computing and are going to make a longer-term career in security. Uh, this is also the difference right now when people talk about training and education. There's a, there's a huge need for people to go out right now, fix systems that are deployed, configure systems in a reliable way, configure firewalls, intrusion detection, apply patches. Huge need. Great, great immediate job prospects for people who understand how to do that well. But in the longer term, if we're looking out over a 20 or 30 year career, it's going to be very important for our people who are in this field to understand operating systems, databases, algorithms, the history of security, much of which has not made its way into Google, uh, for instance, because longer term trends and more fundamental issues require a deeper knowledge and a broader knowledge of what goes on. So to return to your question, if somebody's interested in getting into the field, if they want to have a quick hit for a job, they want to do some, some of that uh, hands-on kind of thing, explore systems, maybe get a job where they can sort of apprentice with others and learn on the way. But if they're really interested in making a long-term contribution to the field, they're probably going to have to study a broader array of things than just learning how to hack systems. Yeah, I've always said that. It's, and I've never quite made the distinction like that, but you're absolutely correct. I think there's some that there's the immediate need, but there are others who, if you practice security in, in different areas or even practice administration, networking, and those such things and learn how to build systems, and then I think you have a much better background in security. Um, yeah, I've... Uh, made the comparison sometimes for uh, we have these contests, these hacking contests that who can who can uh, get into a system, capture the flag, who can expose vulnerabilities. Uh, that's a skill set. It, it requires a, a particular kind of view of how systems operate and how people behave. But if you're talking about overall engineering, there's a different skill set for building, designing, and building an automobile than there is for knowing how to pick the locks and pour sugar in the gas tank. Mm. And it, uh, not everybody understands there is that difference. Right. Um, so what are some of the most significant uh, computer security threats that we face right now that we're probably aware of? Well, that's a very broad topic. Um, I would say one of the biggest underlying problems we have is a lack of awareness of the risks and the variety of threats that our systems are exposed to. And, and the reason that's I'm viewing that as a threat is because it's an overall awareness and positioning threat. If we have authorities who don't understand really how significant some of these issues are, if we don't have uh, business leaders and policymakers making the right investments in security, we're going to continue to have problems. So I, I would really say fundamentally, that's probably the biggest problem we have. Um, but if you look at the broad array of systems from embedded systems, laptops, uh, uh, smartphones, some of the embedded computing that we have up to cloud computing, there are there are a huge variety of different kinds of threats to those uh, posed by different actors, different consequences, and it's it's really difficult to say that there's one that stands out as the largest. Mm. What are some of the the threats out there that no one seems to be addressing that may come around to really bite us like five to ten years or now from now? Well. I'm not sure I would classify it as a threat per se, 
I think one of the biggest problems we have in the field right now is there's huge investments being put into short-term fixes and very large government resource investments being made in offensive uh, cyber operations. We've, we're really failing to invest in two areas. And one is in development of the workforce and, and the, the bigger ideas, the longer term education. And the second one is we're not doing a very good job in investing in law enforcement. That's it's an interesting challenge because, you know, we're we're talking about having enough people in our field that have the proper skill set and the folks in law enforcement, um, you know, their their primary job is not what we do. Uh, so it's a it's an interesting challenge. Yeah, and I think it, it, it adds a complication that we've seen because we're not doing enough in education and we don't have enough people in the system. Their reaction to things that we take for granted seems extreme or unusual. So some of the responses to protest online, some of the responses that are made to um, putting up websites or the over responses to some forms of um, defacement or otherwise are indicative of a problem to actually work with and educate the people in that field. At the same time, there's an awful lot of misbehavior going on huge thefts of intellectual property, uh, vandalism that really destroys things that, that matter to people. And that's where we need coordinated law enforcement response. And we just don't have the people or the tools to do it. It is inconsistent. And I mean, there've been stories in the news of uh, how prosecutors behave and, but uh, you know, I mean, there, there are a lot of inconsistencies in that and it is uh, quite a challenge. Yes. And if we, if we look historically, if you look at the history of, of engineering and of law enforcement and a few such items until law enforcement and politicians got caught up on the technology and learned about it, they tended to overreact. The laws that restricted what people could do with early automobiles, uh, early radios, early telephone were all really inconsistent with how we use the technology today because the people making the rules and some of the ones who felt most threatened by them didn't understand the technology. Can you give an example? So because it's, I've it's never something heard that, that we have to do more than simply work on the technology. We've got to work on helping the policymakers understand it. Go ahead, Allison. Yeah. Um, you mentioned like early laws dealing with uh, early radio, automobile and other stuff. Um, I mean, I haven't heard about how this stuff was dealt with back in the day. So can you give me uh, like... Days. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent this morning, like, on his lawn, playing, yeah. like, Frisbee. <laughs> Get off my lawn. And he just, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, like, how did they deal with it back then when radio and cars and TV was new? Like, what kind of overreacting laws did they make up then? Well, um, so, for instance, one of the, um, one of the early concerns with radio is that uh, criminals would use it to coordinate their activities to evade law enforcement. And so they wanted to, to in, in some places they did, make it illegal to have um, radios in cars. Hmm. Uh, it, was, it was a criminal offense to actually have a radio in a car. And now we move forward and look at, look at all the places radios are used. In fact, for the police themselves, Every, every police officer generally has at least one radio on his or her belt with a mic up near their uh, shoulder, and they use that to coordinate their actions. So they didn't understand how to use the technology. They weren't the first adopters, and therefore they were afraid of how it might be used. So Some I have... kinds of things happen with the automobile in some locales where because they were owned by people who had more money, more resources... Uh, they weren't common. They weren't well understood. Uh, the the police had laws in place about how fast they could be used, um, put restrictions in place that uh, I'm trying to remember the locale, but in one place, to use an automobile, you had to have someone walking in front with a red flag, letting people know that an automobile was coming. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, because they were worried about... Just when you think you have a bad job. <laughs> <laughs> 
So they were worried about criminals, for instance, using the automobiles to scare the horses and, and, and do getaways. Uh, and of course, now they're, they're used as well by law enforcement. So I think part of what we have going on here is uh, many of the people who make our laws, many of the people who are threatened by them, don't really understand all of the potential uses of the technology. And so they tend to overreact to, to prohibit things that shouldn't be there. A, a wonderful example of this is the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The, uh, uh, the law, actually, it's a series of laws that uh, became part of the U.S. Criminal Code, uh, Title 18, Section 1030. And that includes um, making it a criminal act to, to exceed the terms of use of an online service. Now, think about that for any other kind of device that we have. If you have terms of use of a CD player or, or terms of use of your lawnmower and you exceed or, or do something that isn't in those, it, that isn't a criminal offense. Yet, those laws have been built because there hasn't been an understanding yet of how to protect and how to use that technology and what's appropriate for it. Uh, on this subject, um, I'm glad we brought it up. I had a question in there about legislation because there's a lot of talk lately about cybersecurity legislation um, that will improve, you know, the security of all of our systems. So, what, if anything, should be included in this cybersecurity legislation that would truly make things better, in your opinion? Um, so when you say our security, really you're referring to the U.S. because that's where the legislation is being proposed. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified. Yeah, the U.S. legislation. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that's the thing that I think many of our legislators are overlooking is uh, computer systems and networks are interrelated throughout the world. Mm. And attacks in other places can have ripple through effects on us. We're not alone in this. We're all connected together. So... Uh, the legislation, some of what's been proposed, has really been to try to push industry into adopting better practices, uh, hiring better personnel, mm -hmm. and improve information sharing. I believe that all of those are worthy goals. The, the information sharing in particular could be very valuable. Right now, um, a lot of the problems that occur are just kept quiet. They're kept quiet by companies because they're afraid they'll expose their vulnerabilities or hurt their, pri their uh, stock prices. Um, government classifies them for similar reasons. And as a result, there isn't that information flow that would help us protect against our systems at large, and especially the population uh, at large, not, not just the government agencies and not just the big companies, but the end users. Uh, so if we we're going to have some legislation, I would actually think we'd be better off requiring uh, more publication and sharing of that kind of information. And a second area that could be beneficial is to remove or, or, or protect some of the ISPs. Uh, the ISPs are in a position to see which machines have turned into botnets or, or uh, spam, uh, spam net kind of machines. They can see command and control on the ISP networks, but they're worried about liability if they go after them or disclose them. We could provide some shields for them. That would help. Uh, so there's a, there's a number of small fixes like that mm -hmm. that could make a difference. What, what about laws? And I, I tend to think of other industries and Jack, you know, talks a lot about the auto industry and I don't know how much of it is a uh, compliance or standard or how much of it is law, but there are certain regulations that govern the safety of vehicles. Uh, a lot of times we try and translate that into computer security and, and often it doesn't work out or, or doesn't have benefits. So what are, what are some of the things if you were to say, uh, come up with legislation that would say your computer security needs to be of this level? There are issues there. What, what what are they, and why doesn't that always work as effectively? Um, a lot of legal reasoning, a lot of this kind of reasoning goes by analogy, and that works only insofar as the analogies are good. We don't have that many things that are truly analogous to computing mm. or computer networks. 
because there we're dealing with communications, information flow that's under control of individuals without a huge investment. That makes a difference in how we view some of the problems. Uh, one of the biggest differences is that most of what we've done with computing has grown up without liability that would accrue to the owners or operators of those systems or the people who write and develop the software. For automobiles, for airplanes, for lawnmowers, uh, toasters, there is liability that is assessed against the people and organizations who misdesign those or operate them poorly. You don't provide appropriate instructions. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine doing that with some of our computing devices. <laughs> uh, that, that actually is a huge economic pressure, a driver for safety. Because if you want to have insurance, if you want to protect yourself against those kind of lawsuits, you have to think ahead about the potential misuses, about the unsafe aspects of what you're doing. And if you're a responsible vendor, you're going to build in the defenses, you're going to use better quality materials, you're going to use trained engineers, because that's the way to avoid those problems or reduce your costs. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. My hairdryer comes with something that says, don't put it in the bathtub. But, you know, my mobile phone, my smartphone doesn't come with something that says, you know, don't succumb to SMS, you know, spam attacks or whatever. Right. And, and uh, even there... The question is, why, why is it susceptible to SMS spam attacks or, mm -hmm. or viruses um, is another aspect of that same problem. The, the label on the hairdryer may be a little excessive, but it is part of an education aspect about appropriate use of the technology. Mm -hmm. where, where are the, as you said, where are the warning labels? Where's the education that we give? To people when they go to the store and they buy the latest version of some smart device, uh, they have to find out on their own. They have to figure out what all of those commands are. There's no instructions about where to download the updates, where to get defensive software, or even the fact that they need defensive software. Right, right. So that Real. whole feedback loop that would be provided by liability and insurance is missing. Mm -hmm. And There's that makes it very difficult to use some of the analogies on other engineering like automobiles or, or aircraft, and apply that to computing. One of the things that's uh, a challenge with the uh, you know the, the safety label or warning label is that on computers, it's a pop-up window, which it didn't take long for um, malicious folks to realize, hey, we can make our own pop-ups. So uh, because it's not uh, you know directly attached to the ladder that tells you, uh, you know, don't do dumb stuff, you know, um, the the mechanisms were quickly subverted too because you know it's coming out of the computer. It's not a, a it's not that um, there's no external yeah, validation right. of it's, the it's warning. Actually, part of the problem, right? And most of those shrink wrap licenses absolve the vendor and the opera uh, whoever it is, the OEM, uh, from pretty much all liability. It's hidden in the language. They've got all kinds of restrictions. And we have developed a legal tradition in the U.S. around this technology, around software and hardware, uh, to allow them to do that. That, I think, is part of the problem. If you're not responsible, if, there are, if things don't work properly, you probably aren't going to put as much effort and care into building it. It's a great segue into one of my other questions. and we've, we've talked about incentives, and I think it's a very important point. Um, how do we adjust incentives to motivate programmers, for example, to write more secure code and, or how do we motivate companies to produce more secure products? Um, incrementally would be my initial <laughs> <resource>. <laughs> outstanding. Uh, we, uh, we have a difficulty in getting the vast majority of programmers who are out there now to write better code because, first of all, most of them have not been trained in it. They don't have the tools, uh, but there's actually a market penalty for doing that. Mm. If you're currently writing an app or a smartphone 
that you're going to sell through some app store and make a gazillion dollars in doing it. You are rewarded for being the one to have the first app of that kind on the market, not for having one that is bulletproof from any attack. We've got to change that kind of uh, approach in the market. It's difficult in part because we don't have a way to measure and express the vulnerability or security of any particular item that we would have in this arena. Uh, the education part takes time. The tools, some of them are there, but people don't use them for a variety of reasons. Uh, for example, there are some safer languages that can be used, but people continue to write things in C uh, or Java, which is supposed to be safer, but it depends on whose interpreter you're running. That Those are issues that we have to address if we're going to make a difference. Is it? it and we're not going to be able to do it all at once. We're not going to be able to do it with everybody at once. We're going to have to find ways to incrementally get people to demand better and reward those who actually put the effort in. You know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a human behavioral thing that I see so much of. For example, I like to smoke cigars. The first thing someone asks when they walk into a cigar shop is what's new, right? Technology is the same thing. We walk into the, the computer store or we go online and we want everything that's new and we want the latest thing. And like you said, Gene, it, it doesn't matter the security of it all. So how do yeah, we work exactly. to change human behavior? That's not an easy thing, right? No, no. And uh, in part, that's a value system. Uh, you can, when you look at uh, human behavior in, in some um some other arenas, if people are informed about the risk, many of them will make better decisions, mm. but not all do because they're not really good at weighing the risks. And that's, as you say, that's a human behavioral problem, even with education. If you look at the general population, they don't understand how risk applies to them. They will drive without seatbelts. They will smoke cigarettes. They will eat huge amounts of very salty, fatty foods from fast food locations. They will drive drunk and where they'll go, they'll go places where they believe they have a lucky number wearing their lucky socks to gamble their money away. <laughs> they, they simply don't have a good sense of um, how the odds apply to them or they don't believe they do. And, and so that's where some of the job of us as professionals come in is trying to anticipate some of the places where we can make those decisions ahead of time and build them into the system so that they don't become choices that may be misapplied by the ignorant. Hmm. So uh, how has the, the widespread adoption of mobile device and smartphone technology, has that changed security or is it really just the same thing on a different platform? It's changed security in a way that I don't think has been fully appreciated um, in that the theft or loss of those endpoints creates a very different kind of risk model than it does with or did for many computers or even laptops or desktops. People are out there, they sit on their cell phones, they drop them in the toilet, uh, uh, they're stolen on subway cars or street corners. And if they haven't taken due care to set a good password or encryption, if um, they haven't done appropriate backups, they lose much more information more readily mm. than they would with... A mainframe with a console connected to it. Kind of hard to drop a mainframe in the toilet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There have been many a times I wish I could. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think that's one thing that's changed quite a bit. Uh, it's also the case now where those systems, because of their wireless, um, and many of the wireless protocols aren't as strong as they could be because they use too much battery to use strong encryption, um, those are now taken into potentially hostile environments on a regular basis. 
not so much with a desktop computer. Mm. It's in a fixed environment that has a sort of fixed level of hostility. It's not quite the same as carrying around. Yeah, a yeah. you know it's interesting. I, I had another question there because uh, Larry Pesci is the other member of Paul.com. He couldn't, unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight, but he frequently recites the quote that you had. Uh, this is the only true secure system is the one that's powered off, cast in a block of concrete, and sealed in a lead-lined room with armed guard, armed guards. And even then, I have my doubts. So, how do we balance security and usability? Now that, as we've said, we've gone from this one giant shared computer to everyone owning a laptop and a smartphone. It all comes down to risk. We do things on a regular basis that have risk associated with them. Where the potential loss is large, we may exercise more caution or we make more investment in protective mechanisms to help protect us from that risk. Because we don't fully understand all the risk, because there isn't the feedback loop to reduce risk in using all of this technology, we have tended to go for usability and flash. Uh, not the program, but <laughs> the view. That's, that's a whole other problem. <laughs> a whole different set of problems. We can balance usability and overall security and safety only when we really understand what some of the risk is and understand how much of it we're willing to tolerate. And this is a very difficult thing to do because we don't have the numbers, we don't have the analytic mechanisms, and we don't have the internalization yet. People want to use the convenience. They want to have the new, as you noted. Mm. And it is, it is very difficult to get people to accept better mechanisms and to limit their use because they don't understand what those risks are. They don't see them. The, the threat of someone coming in over the network and stealing your information and installing a, a, a botnet, uh, a client that's going to use your system uh, to send out spam or attack other hosts is not something you see either prior to doing it or while it's happening. And so you're not really willing to accept restrictions on your system simply to deal with something that doesn't obviously affect you. That's where some of the challenge comes in in this field, not from the people who are doing the penetration testing and the immediate patching of systems. That's the longer term issue I was talking about, understanding uh, the, the broader scope of security and, and design. And, and that's where the big challenges come in. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I want to switch to a little um, more lighthearted question to kind of break right, things wait, up. Before, from, before we do that, I, oh, want, I want to throw something at uh, that. Not um, yet. After Jack's question, then a more lighthearted question. <laughs> yeah, well, this, this, you can answer it as flippant. Um, you know, we've chatted about this before, but so my background is uh, I've, I uh, have, uh, dropped out of, or more honestly, drunk out of at least once, uh, you know, really crappy community colleges. So I'm not um, uh, an expert in higher education, but even with my background as a dropout, one of the things that concerns me about the, the state of um, information security education is that uh, the, the online and for-profit colleges seem to be making part of information security and information technology, as well as a myriad of other fields, more accessible, more approachable, um, make it easier to work into people's, uh, you know, into their lives. But one of the things that I wonder about is the, the value. One of the things that I miss, and I know I missed by not doing a traditional college background, was that um, that research, that study for the stake for purely the sake of um, exploration of knowledge, you know, the, the development of the skills of learning rather than what you learn, but how to learn. And I know those are things that, you know, I had to do the best I could kind of faking it on my own, but that's part of what I think uh, a college education delivers is that some, some level of academic freedom. And I, I assume that, uh, you know, financial pressures are taking that out of, um, traditional colleges and universities as well. But I just wondered if you could uh, tell me if I'm completely full of crap on this, like most things, or if this is something that's uh, 
you know, a worthwhile trade-off or you have any thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, that's, that's another one of these topics that doesn't have a, a simple answer to it. The education that people get in a residential or even a commuting college of some kind is a lot more than simply what's contained in the books. There are issues of socialization, of norms, of interacting with other people. And good instructors illustrate, based on very immediate feedback from the students, uh, they, they give further illustration, they give further depth, um, and they may bring together topics beyond simply just what's listed as uh, the current one in the syllabus. So as we've noted, there's a lot of human problem in security. There's also physical problems. And when I teach, I'm teaching uh, our advanced computing uh, security course now, and I include stories that highlight how cryptography isn't enough if people steal your disk. Uh, and I suppose all that could be done in an online course. Some of those are very valuable. They're going to expose people to information they might not be able to afford otherwise. Uh, but this, some of the studies I've seen indicate that people who do online coursework have much poorer retention of the material than people who actually experience it in a, a, a classroom kind of environment. So there is value to be had in exposing more people to those concepts. That's one of the things I said earlier. So these online courses and, and otherwise, I think there's value there. The problem comes if we have anybody mistaking that for being the same as an in-depth education uh, immersed in an environment that is dedicated to education. We still need that. Maybe not for everybody, but it's still very necessary. I don't know. Did that answer your question, Jack? Yeah. I mean, well, it's like, like you said, there isn't a simple answer, but I, I, it occurs to me that if, if that, yeah, it, it just seemed to me that if that seems that way to me, somebody that has the, the closer view would, uh, well, it, would have that perspective. Um, you know, you, I know you worked in the automobile business and, um, I've got a car that, the mechanics have to go to school several months a year just to be right. able to know how to how to maintain it properly. Okay, but not every car is like that. And and where they got their start was probably working in a garage with somebody else. They didn't go to classes for right. that. We have a range of necessary skills and understanding. Part of the problem in this arena is we refer to it as cybersecurity, or we refer to it as as hacking or we refer to it, you know, whatever title you want to pick. And people mistake the skills and knowledge of how to apply that particular thing to actually be a significant portion of the whole. And it's not. We have, we have actually dozens of career areas that people could spend many, many years studying to be good at. And the, the people who've only studied a little aspect of it don't even know enough to know what those things are and what's required for them. Um, so that's that's part of the issue, again, of, of the maturation of the field is, is getting that awareness of how big it is, what the complexities are, and where someone's skill should fall in that range to, to do what they're best capable of doing. Uh, so, Gene, I want to just interject with a, a question. Um, so you've been called by some, such as people such as Gene Kim, as a cross between Einstein, a Disney professor, James Bond, and Mr. Bean. How would you respond to that? <laughs> um, more Mr. Bean, less James Bond. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Great answer. Great answer. Uh, a more serious question uh, that, that came from Gene. I, I chatted with him very briefly today. Um, you've influenced a generation of security practitioners, but you've also personally mentored people like Dan Farmer, who wrote Cops, Gene Kim, who wrote Tripwire, Sandeep Kumar, who advanced intrusion detection, and numerous others. Why do you suppose you've had such a big influence? Um, 
I've been asked that question before, and it's difficult to answer uh, because I don't necessarily know that I've had that much influence. Part of it certainly comes about by being in a location or an area early on and helping define it, recognizing problems and trying to address them. But I think one reason that I've had a great deal of influence with what we've done here at Purdue um, and elsewhere by some of the graduates of the program have gone out and done things is to stress that it's not a computing issue. It's a systems issue where people are part of the system. That we have to understand people are part of it. There are economics issues. There are policy issues. Um, it's not simply understanding code. And the people who've gone on to make a difference embrace that. They understand they have to communicate. They understand they have to deal with people. And, and that they have to solve real problems for people where the problems aren't simply how do I make my system secure, but how do I get my job done? Um, how, do I, how do I accomplish the goals that I have that are independent of security? Um, really, security should be transparent. It, it isn't an end in and of itself. If a system is secure enough, people do their jobs with it and they don't notice it. That's really what should be ha happening. That's like talking about fireproofing. Um, who talks about the people who go out and do fireproofing? We don't unless something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, people use fireproof materials to get their jobs done. They sit in offices that they're confident won't catch fire. In fact, that doesn't even immediately occur to them because that's not a problem for them anymore. That's where we need to be, and that's the kind of attitude I've tried to instill in my students and colleagues. Excellent. Did anyone else uh, in the studio here have questions? Yes, uh, I have Go a ahead, question. Um, so you talked earlier about all these like overreaching laws uh, regarding new technology, like cars and radios and all that. Um, back then, when that happened. Uh, what was the thing that caused the lawmakers to say, hey, this law is stupid. Let's like restore a little bit of sanity here and allow radios and cars and things like that. Like, do you like what's the catalyst that's what's it going to take for lawmakers nowadays to restore a little bit of sanity to computer laws? Uh, awareness is, is part of it. Um more widespread availability of the technology they're concerned with will help. The protests around the proposed uh, Stop Online Piracy Act, the SOPA Act, and the corresponding uh, PIPA Act really drove home to them, to many of the legislators who previously hadn't thought about it, how some of their decisions could impact far more than simply copyright or uh, trade, uh, trademark infringement. So part of this is a, a, a culturalization issue, uh, an accessibility issue. We are in the midst of the change as it's going on. And so to us, it's very painful. We see, we see large distances. It, it only begins to make a little bit more sense in the longer term when, when we look back. Uh, privacy is another area uh, with telephones. The original telephones, when they came out, were massive party lines. I don't think anybody really has party lines anymore. A few of us old timers can remember them. But the idea behind the phone was everybody on the same loop, perhaps everybody in the same neighborhood, had the same phone number, the same circuit. And when one person was talking, everybody else could pick up and listen in. There was no technology that prohibited, and there was no law. Uh, the original laws on, on telephones allowed the police to install wiretaps and collect whatever information they wanted. It wasn't until the technology became widely used, many people, including legislators and jurists, uh, had telephones and were concerned about how information might have been overheard, and the technology became available for people to get private lines 
that the law changed. It takes a while. And that's, that's just a reality of the law and of technology and human nature. We're getting there, but it's going to take a while longer yet. So do you think that means that one day eventually there'll be like a law saying, oh, uh, the Twitter is not allowed to hand over whatever to the government just because they ask? Like, do you think there's going to be a law like that at some point? Um, yes, I, well, where the current law is going to be interpreted better for that. Uh, companies like Twitter and Facebook and eBay and Amazon have it a little difficult because they're multinational and they're operating in places with lots of different laws defining privacy and evidence and uh, and the like, and it makes it more difficult. In some places, they can turn that information over voluntarily if they're not asked first because they suspect something is going on. Other places, they're strictly prohibited from turning anything over until there's a, a government request. Uh, there's a wide range of laws there. There's a wide range of behaviors. And they have to operate somehow within all of those. Those of us who use those systems are going to have to understand what it is we want and work towards a better definition of, of privacy and limits on law enforcement. Yeah, it sounds like a really difficult problem to solve. I mean, like right now I work at an MSSP and part of our operational process involves reading people's email and looking at all the porn they watch because <laughs> I mean, seriously, if they get like a attachment that contains possibly a virus or they visit some porn website that triggers an IDS alert, it ends up getting passed to this third party that monitors their IDS. So, I mean, there's like a lot of really technical uh, down in the weeds kind of issues that need to be solved here, even when we're talking about privacy, which I think is important. And, and I think it's, it's, we're making it worse with some of the technology because um, we have cloud providers now that maybe in another state or another country, our files may be spread across several jurisdictions and whose laws are going to govern becomes even more difficult. Um, the some of the laws on electro, the ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, was really written at a time of stored uh, of stored mail on mainframes. Now, when we're dealing with remote access over over links and and uh, um, viewers that aggregators at, at websites, the laws don't make sense. So, I uh, one of my roles is I'm. Uh, uh, chair of ACM's U.S. Public Policy Council. And we spend a lot of time interacting with lawmakers, trying to uh, educate them about issues in computer uh, uh, computer and network behavior uh, to help them understand how to do a better job with the laws. There's a lot that needs to be done there, and there aren't many people in computing who are taking that kind of role. So that's another aspect of this problem. It's a human problem, not a technical problem, we can have a lot of people who, who have web logs and, and banner pages that say they're against certain kinds of laws, but actually engaging the lawmakers and having discussion with them and helping educate them can be a tedious pro a process, and we need more people involved in that. Yeah, uh, it seems like there's also a lot of big money involved in these uh, legislative battles. Uh, like, for example, Google and Reddit got really involved in the SOPA protests. And uh, I'm wondering what you think uh, when big money gets involved in these privacy and legal issues um, regarding computing, do you think that it's going to work out in favor of the people or if it's going to only benefit the large companies that already dominate the Internet? Well, a question you have to ask about is the role of government and what you mean by benefit. Um, well, for example, uh, like in the case of Gmail, uh, laws that might make it easier for the government to retrieve Gmail might make it harder for Gmail to profit off advertising. So perhaps in that case, they might try to fight for privacy. Uh, but then on the other hand, Gmail might want to make it easier to mine people's emails for advertising related stuff. 
I mean, like when you balance that out, who do you think it's going to benefit in the end? There are arguments to be made on all sides here. The, for instance, uh, not to necessarily pick on, on Google, but um, if you're using a service where they do data mining and they're able to present you with a better experience and better offer for what you need, a uh, better search online to find what you're after, um, isn't that a benefit? Uh, there are two things actually here that you're talking about that, that are, are related but different. One is criminal law and one is civil law. And so the criminal law aspect is what kinds of things are law enforcement and intelligence agencies uh, allowed to do? Uh, what kinds of things can you be arrested for doing online? And there we have to look towards the, the issues of civil liberties that we value and that we want to express. Uh, we have to learn not to be afraid of so many things. Uh, I think the Patriot Act is, a, is an example of that, where so many people accept these restrictions over a very set, a small, unlikely set of things that might happen. Uh, TSA is another example. But then there's also the issue of civil laws and civil regulations. And there are a lot of that is governed by contract, what we're willing to, to put up with. Um, which service are we going to go to? Um, where are we going to take our business? Where are we going to put our advertising dollars? And if the vast majority of people don't seem to mind the problem, uh, that's not likely to change.